starting the meeting. Welcome to you all. As you can see, I've taken off my jacket, so do feel free to do the same thing. It's quite a warm evening. Just in terms of basic housekeeping uh, for fire procedure, no planned fire drills this meeting. So if we hear the fire alarm, then we treat it as a real emergency and evacuate the building via the nearest gate route. And that's via the stairs to your left as you leave the council chamber or public gallery. Exit by the door at the back of the building and walk across the inner car park to the evacuation point, which is the pavement opposite the police station. The lifts can't be used in the event of an emergency. Please do not enter, re enter the building until you're advised it is safe to do so by a member of staff. Right, I think the next thing we do is to go on to. Um, well, Paul, perhaps you could explain who is here and who's apologised. Yes, thank you. Uh, as members would have seen that we got the vice chairman in the chair because unfortunately, uh, Councillor Lever is um, self isolating because he believes he may have COVID. Um, and also, we've got um, deputies or substitute members for Councillor Beston and Councillor Quirk. So we've got Councillors uh, Ellis and Councillor Drew uh, substituting tonight. We are expecting Councillor Downer. He's on his way. He's just dropped his wife off at the Red Funnel Ferry. And also on the members of the committee, it's noted that Andrew Garrett was a member, but he has now resigned because he's chairman of the audit committee. And he feels that he, he should be just concentrating on those roles rather than scrutiny. So full council will be making an appointment to that position in the future. And we've also got apologies from a uh, cabinet member, uh, Judy Jones Evans. Well, thank you. Uh, the next, next item is the minutes. Um, I'm quite happy with them. Is there anyone like to propose approval? Or anything else? Sorry, Luke. I wasn't at the last meeting, but Councillor Clerk has um, advised me that he has no problems with the minutes. So if it's appropriate, I can propose them. I'll second them, please. Thank you, Councillor Walls. Yeah, that done. Right, I'd like to invite members to declare any interest they might have in matters on the agenda. Do we have any declaration of interest? No. I've got two, I'm afraid. Um, I'm been kind of involved in helping out a little bit with the uh, progress with installation of charging points for electric vehicles. And I'm also the chairman of the planning committee. So both five, points five and six, I have uh, non pecuniary uh, interest to declare. But I'm not intending to say anything about those two things anyway. So if there's nothing else, we move on to public question time. We've had no questions from the public submitted. Is that right, Paul? That's correct, Chairman. And uh, there's no one here in the public gallery. So we'll move on to item four, which is progress on outcomes and recommendations from previous meetings. So I'm going to hand over to Paul Thistlewood to take us through that um, through pages 11 to 14. Yes, this is the standard update on the actions that members have agreed to at past meetings and showing the latest state of play. I can also update you now that I've now today received um, the uh, survey that the Island Road's undertaken about weed killer on highways. So I'll be circulating that later on today, Chairman. But if there's any queries, more than happy to deal with those. If not, if members want to note those and move on to the next business. Are there any points that anyone wishes to raise on the plan? Probably not. No. Okay, thank you. I've had a request that we um, change the agenda slightly and bring forward a digital uh, digital strategy. Uh, this is because um, Councillor Stevens has a very early start for London tomorrow morning and would like to do his bit um, so he can get home and have something to eat and pack his bag. Thank you. So over to you, Councillor Stevens. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, and I. Uh, I thank you for uh, bringing the item forward. Um, 
because as I say, I've, I've got a very early start tomorrow, I have it every day. Um, yeah, uh, this is part of the uh, ambitious uh, regeneration uh, public service program that uh, the Isle of Wight Council embarked on in 2017. To date, um, the investment has been 3.8 million. And uh, obviously, there's been a heck of a lot of uh, stakeholder um, engagement. And in actual fact, we've had, uh, we've, we've had I think, about up to 20, uh, 20 uh, stakeholders uh, involved in, uh, after the discussion stage, actually involved in formulating a way forward. As I say, this started in 2017, so it's something that's it's been ongoing, but it's proved it's worth during the pandemic um, with uh, obviously people wishing to contact each other, but also with SMEs around the Isle of Wight being able to, uh, able to engage with uh, uh, their suppliers and indeed their, uh, their producers. So it's been, it's been uh, a good shot and a good, a good way forward. Uh, as I say, recognised back in 2017, so it's ongoing. It's ongoing work. Um, the uh, I'll just read. I'll just read a part. A part of one May, which you can follow if you want. Uh, but um, I want to go to uh, the background 2.2, where the council recognised the opportunity presented by digital technology back in 2017, um, and the inaugural conference set out to understand the potential. Uh, for digital technologies to address some of the real challenges the island, the island faced. So this is a way that we can actually start to, if we, if, if we continue along this line, and I know we will because we've got the uh, strategy and uh, uh, an action plan that underpins it. So I look at that and I think, well, we don't want to see our island businesses disadvantaged. You know, the island's a great place, but it can be even greater with digital technology for all those um, businesses that require it. And um, as I said, you know, if you look at 2.5, that that puts reference to the steering group, etc. So we're not just doing it on our own. We're out there, um, and we've got ongoing dialogue with uh, our stakeholders and then, and indeed in, interested parties. I must pay tribute to White Fibre, who were um, actually uh, implementing the uh, uh, installation of uh, fibre around the Isle of Wight. Um, I know that some, sometimes White Fibre are criticised, but what I would say is the end game is to actually make sure that we are not disadvantaged by our ge geographical presence. Um, I just want to mention on uh, once again, I'm going back to this because I think that the paper itself sets out everything so so well, and for me to try and uh, blurb it out, it really, it's much better for me to read about the rationale behind the development of Digital Island, which is on page 53, uh, paragraph 2.8. And there it says what it is, supporting delivery of existing plans and policies, uh, economic growth, re regeneration, carbon and environment, tourism supporting digital tra transformation of council services. And that's very important because you and I know from be being in council, the cost of actually generating a piece of paper and, and, the, and the paper that goes between departments, not only between departments, but also to our stakeholders and our, and our partners out there in, uh, in the rest of the island and mainland. So I think that what we've got is um, work in progress, uh, the strategy is there, and indeed the work plan is there, which supports it. I'd just like to say that the recommendation is uh, to the Policy and Scrutiny Committee to note the progress with Digital Island, uh, Isle of Wight Digital Strat Strategy, and the committee provide comments on the potential priorities for the next phase of the strategy, given the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which I said, you know, when we when we when I started just now, that it was it really assisted us. As a, as a local authority to deliver services, which quite probably we wouldn't have been able to be uh, deliver, or we'd have found it horrendously difficult to deliver those services. And once you've got difficult delivery of services, you've got an impact of finance. So all around it, I think it's, it's served its purpose. 
and as I say, it's a moving it's a moving document from 2017 to the to, to the current day. I don't think that the alliance would take uh, uh, the plaudits for this. I think that what what's happened before is a continuance of where we were and where we're going to. So if you have any questions or um, any comment, please uh, come forward. Over to you. Thank you very much, Thank Deputy you. Leader. Is that all I have comments? Councillor. Um, thank you, Councillor Stevens, and thank you for acknowledging that some of the work was already done by the previous administration. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have one question, which may not may not be appropriate to give me if it isn't. Um, you draw our attention to 2.8, and at the bottom of that it says a key part of the development of the digital island is to ensure technology, blah, blah, and then it says does not create uncertainty and alienation for those who might left behind. Forgive me if I've missed this because I, th I came in late as a substitute and have only kind of skim read through what's being done for people that don't have you know the access i mean if the council are it's wonderful that we're switching so much over to digital but what about the people that that will cause to be left behind thank you for that we're an inclusive council so we won't leave anyone alone and this is part partly why we've got such a broad foundation of a, of a group that makes comments that you know the NHS Trust, for instance, and others uh, contribute to uh, where the direction of travel travel with the strategy. So we will not rest assured we will not leave anyone behind. Uh, you know, it started it started out as being an inclusive uh, way forward. It will continue to be so. And as I say, you know, we we will, every time we come across a hurdle, and I, I dare say that uh, you know the the, the director Chris Ashman said. Uh, managed to jump over a few hurdles uh, so far. I would say that we're, we meet them and we deal with them and we don't just deal with them on our own. We deal with them uh, with our stakeholders and, uh, and, and our service providers. That's right. This is a, happy with that. Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, just following up on that, I, I appreciate that this digital strategy is very much about what the Council can do in terms of our firm commitments. I know obviously some residents on the island have concerns about perhaps how third party providers are um, addressing that issue of accessibility. Um, it's obviously tangentially related, I, I know, but um, we've seen a lot of correspondence in the county press about white link, the um, decision to implement uh, a purely digital um, acceptance of payments. Does the council need to be maybe a little bit more robust in vindicating those sorts of rights? In other words, do we need to be engaging potentially in litigation, looking at the impact of the Equality Act on behalf of residents, is that something we could uh, perhaps address? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor yes, Drew. Rest assured that uh, the uh, the administration does robustly uh, engage with uh, all ferry operators, and so we should on behalf of the residents. Um, we take we 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 take cons considerable pride in our um, relationships with those with with those ferry operators but we we are we are not a hundred percent you know uh, how can I say comfortable with with some of the decisions that are made for uh, at company level because that that's something that we have to marry up and I'll pass it over to, to uh, Chris, if you'd like to say something, because quite honestly, I haven't been in, engaged with with that area. But I, mu I must I must say that the people in, within the uh, Alliance Cabinet would make sure that uh, our residents, our businesses, would not be disadvantaged. Sorry, Mr. Ashman. We're waiting for Mr. Ashman's microphone to come on. Yeah. 
yeah, thank you. I just wanted to come back on Councillor Ellis's point on this point as well on the inclusiveness. Um, very important element referenced in the strategy as well as in the, the, the report that you mentioned. Um, the, obviously, the pandemic in some sense is advantage to us in this, in the terms of people had to uh, engage with platforms where they haven't before. And what that has happened at scale really is, is exposed the challenges that some people have had to that. So I think I, I think for both councillors, in answer to both councillors' concerns and, and, and referencing um, what Councillor Stevens was saying earlier also about the importance of stakeholders. Yes, this is led by the council, but clearly the development of the strategy over a two year period of all our island stakeholders, and particularly you out if I can point to the efforts of Age UK um, in terms of the digital friendly island agenda that they progressed and launched back in November 2021. And I think that was partially as a result of the learning we all had during the pandemic, particularly amongst the 60 group. So uh, I think Councillor Stevens is absolutely spot on. The, the liaisons we have with um, various service providers in other forums need better connection into this agenda. So clearly, as the strategy moves on, that concern, that continuing concern of uh, all being able to access services, being able to be as comfortable as they can be with using those services is the, is the objective. And if our partners, um, of whatever type, whether it's transport organisations or others, uh, are not able to recognise that people need to journey on that, to be told what they must do, but then our job as a, as a public service leader is to work with them to help them get that balance right. Um, but clearly, we don't necessarily have the authority to do that. But through the collaboration through the Transport Infrastructure Board and through uh, uh, collaboration on issues such as growing the economy because of the digital environment, we do have influence and I should use that more often. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Councillor Ward. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I would just like to raise an issue um, that perhaps we need to take into account directly out responsibility for the NHS. But GPs seem to have gone online and the people who generally use the GP services struggle, quite frankly, um, to use it. I've had numerous complaints that they go on, they can't use the, the website. And, and I've tried it myself and it is difficult and I'm computer literate. And, and I just think these you know, when you consider our demographic and we know it's getting older, um, actually we need to perhaps try to influence them to make their systems more user friendly. Just a comment, really. That's it. Can I come in on that? Yeah, yeah. Paul would like to say that. Um, this is an issue that's been raised through the House Scrutiny Committee um, because there's a very good piece of work being done by Health Watch over the last six months on review access. To GP services and there's a lot of learning and good practice actually out there and it's cascading that out so it's consistently across the island so there is work ongoing the health partners are fully aware of yes they are pushing for more digitalization um, online consultation but they're also aware of the work done by Age UK there, there's a group of people and we'll always be a group of people who will not access things unless it's face to face and so the services are reconfiguring, but with the full knowledge that there will be people still wanting to do the face-to-face -face intervention. So there's work ongoing through Councillor Nicholson's committee. Thanks, Councillor Any more questions? Okay, shall we move on to the next sub? Sorry, move on to the next subject, which is. Oh, quite I think, I think Sorry. Chairman, there's there only one part of the recommendation perhaps needs a bit further thought yep. of whether or not there's any potential priorities that the committee feel should be taken into account in the next phase of the strategy. Um, I don't know if you want those tonight or whether or not members want, could have time to reflect on those and let me have those in the next week or so and then we can pass those on Chairman. Councillor Stevens. I think that uh, you know it would be nice to hear tonight but I really think that Councillor Quirk isn't here. He, he might well have input that he wants to uh, bring forward. 
And I think we get a more rounded uh, approach if you uh, deferred it and took it from the members outside of there. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, we'll bear that in mind that uh, comments to be put in writing in the next week, if possible, on prioritisation of, of the strategy. I will send out a reminder email. Thank you. Next agenda item there we have is progress with installation of charging points for electric vehicles. And this will be Councillor Jordan. Hello, Councillor Jordan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, um, as you can see on the agenda, it was going to be an update on progress, um, uh, which I've done in, by way of providing you with a printed version of some of the things I would have said to you. But uh, so I believe it's easier for you to see uh, some of the progress that we are making. Essentially, the project is to deliver uh, numbers of charging points on street and off street. We are on our way in the project. We are behind the curve, that's for sure. We were late starters uh, compared to some of the places in the country, but we're on our way. And uh, some of the on street and off street have been through the process that we need to go through to uh, install them. As you can see from the list on page one, uh, there's the list of on street charge points. These charge points were, were identified by a, co a call out to the public and town and parish councils for suggestions for potential areas to place them. They were then investigated and depending on numbers of factors that are required, uh, these spots were decided. As you can see, some are a, a, a small number are operational, a small number are installed and ready to go. We've had a couple of technical issues, uh, one with a hardware fault with the charger and one with uh, the delay from the grid. We're waiting for Southern Electric SSE to connect up. Uh, and we've identified two further on-road sites. Very much the beginning of the project, though. I have to make that quite clear. Uh, and uh, phase one and phase two of off-street, uh, you can see from the back of, if, if it's, you've got reverse printing, or page two if you haven't, you can see the car parks that we obviously council on car parks, where we are proposing charges and the type of charges that we're proposing. So I won't read them all out, but Newport, Ride, Sandown, Cows, Vent and Freshwater try to get a spread across the island with these charge points. And you can see we're, we've got a mix of charges, rapid, fast, uh, uh, and dual charges in, included. Uh, phase two, additional to the scheme, but um, one, two, three, four, five identified spots, <coughs> excuse me, in Shanklin, Lake Woodbridge, Cows, and Yarmouth, again, uh, fast chargers. That is essentially very briefly where we are with the project, early days, a lot further to go. It will be always a question of matching demand and demand uh, wanting the chargers. We are doing it in partnership. There are issues with delivering this directly by the council. We've chosen the partnership route. Uh, that does produce some income for the council. A charging point, just to cover that off really, a small a charging points around £10,000 cost per charger to install. Um, the council has, as you're probably well aware, one officer involved with this project. Our capacity is low. Our back, a, a great credit to that officer who has a great deal of knowledge and experience, but we don't have the capacity to deliver this directly. Hence, we took the decision to do it in partnership. Chair, that's where we are, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Jordan, do we have any questions on the electric charging? Councillor Ward. Councillor Jordan, thank you for that. That's good stuff. Um, could you? Remind me what went wrong with our original scheme. Because some some of these um, car parks already had charges in them, and then they went out of service, and I never got to know why did they go out of service. Uh, uh, the, the the quick answer, Ian, is that 
uh, we were we were not serviced well by that provider, and hence we've chosen a new provider. So it's not a question of they're redundant. We're using a new provider. Uh, the service from that provider, they, as you rightly say, Ian, and know, uh, some of them were non-operational for long periods of time. wasn't the best service. We we hope the new provider uh, wow. gives us a better service and our public and visitors and residents. So it was down to the provider. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Can I can only throw in one for you, Councillor Jordan, and that's how how the obviously meeting the electric the change of electric prices. We're going to have to have a flexible system of pricing, aren't we, to cope with the crazy variations on electricity prices. And and it's problematic for not only for us, and and part of the reasons that we chose to uh, partner up on this because the rising, increasing, rapidly increasing cost of electricity is throwing. The charging into turmoil in some ways, uh, so it has to be covered. It has to be covered by the operator uh, in terms of he's got to at least uh, cover his costs and make some return on his investment. So uh, it will follow the price of of uh, electricity essentially per unit. Councillor Ward, I've got another one, and this is probably for Councillor Fuller. Paul. Are we looking sympathetically at residents who want to put charging points on their own property? I would hope we would be. Um, certainly, um, I've been in contact with people on a personal basis about wanting to put in um, charging points on, on, on their property. Um, that said, um, there, is, there, are, um, there is mention of it in, in the uh, new iron plan because it is, it is the way to go forward. And we want to make sure that the iron plan is robust for the future. So electric charging points is an important aspect of that. So, yes, I think one of the other things as well is we know that the technology is changing. So whether we are in the same place in 15 years time as we are now, we just don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I think that we would want to look sympathetically towards electric charging points. Um, where wherever somebody wants to put them in place, but you know, certainly speaking to people um, in the industry, it isn't easy at the moment. And there are, you know, I, I, when I was talking to um, people, there is also dialogue that needs to take place with with people like Island Roads to make sure that the infrastructure is there to allow people to access um, uh, the, the the charging points when can that when can they they can be put in place. So yes, I would I would. Certainly, want to work with with um, with with um, with Phil and the team to make sure that we can make it easier for people. I think it's way of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just come, thank you, Paul, for that. Just and and for the committee members, <clears throat> we've had uh, no issues whatsoever with planning in terms of siting. At the installation, any problems we've had that we did have one in Ventnor, which was problematic, uh, it was to do with highways regulations and where you can cite them in terms of pavement size and and, and location on the street, the safety the safetyness of a park car, width of the road, those kind of highways issues uh, have where they have, and I think it's only been Ventnor um, uh, have been problematic. Uh, Planning thus far hasn't been problematic uh, at all, uh, and I thank Paul for um, making helping us on that journey. <laughs> Council Ward, um, conservation zones. Some people are living conservation zones. I think with 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 conservation zones, you you know what it's like, Ian. You've been around the block a lot longer than I have. Um, again, sometimes sometimes um, they are favourable. Um, I, I know in the past, particularly with planning, we had things with um, utility boxes with with iron roads and how they can stand out in conservation areas. Um, again, I think what we need to do is there is a need to perhaps adapt our planning system to look at what is in the future and to make sure that the um, uh, conservation policies are both protected but can be used and adapted in such a way that they work work with um with with service providers 
and I think that's important. I think that dialogue needs to be, uh, that door needs to be opened and kept open. Thank you. Councillor Downer. I'm welcome, by the way. Well, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, red Jets, as you... <laughs> but, uh, there we are. Um, just, uh, and thank you, Councillor Jordan, for your update on the the, uh, the Ventnor situation with the uh, charging point, which I was question I was going to ask, because that caused a bit of a furor right in there. Um, the other thing I'd like to ask about particular charging points, are they going to be different types? Is there going to be a lot of fast charge or a trickle charge, a variable charges? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rodney. Uh, the, yes, there will be all those things. They'll be fast, super fast, uh, and not so fast. <laughs> Some might be even slow, Rodney. <laughs> uh, there'll be a mixture of charges. They're mostly fast charges uh, for obvious reasons. In car parks also, uh, we want people about to charge and go uh, and not necessarily park overnight in a single space. But, uh, and on the road also. It, it, it's a, Look, on, on the road, um, it was interesting to hear him, but planning haven't come up with that, but we, uh, Ian, we can work around that. We can make them look like trees or something. Yeah. We'll paint them camouflage. But um, uh, the, the on-road, there are people who live in our town centres that don't have off-road parking, uh, who at some point will become part of the switch if they uh, own vehicles to electric, one assumes. And we've got to think about and try and manage how those people can charge their vehicles. If if we make it that difficult, the encouragement for people to switch vehicles in the, to meet at some of our, our aspirational targets for net zero uh, is going to be very difficult. So, you know, the, these problems come to test us, Ian. You're absolutely right. Uh, in ride, I've, I, where I'm a ward member, uh, we long ago breached the conversa uh, conservation area. We have plastic windows everywhere. Uh, we, we, we have flat roofs and um, buildings that look like Premier Inns that, house, that are built in the conservation in schools. It's, it's long gone. A, a little charger on the road, I'm sure, is not going to test our planning department too much, I hope. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions on this? No? OK, so we'll move on to the next one, and it's um, Planning Services Review. This is Councillor Fuller. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the uh, peer review report has been circulated to members, and I hope members have had enough time to digest the planning peer challenge. From my point of view, I'm quite excited by the, by the peer challenge. I think um, a lot of us knew that there may have been issues within the planning department and it was very good to have a fresh set of eyes to be able to see where improvements could be made. And I think um, from the uh, response of the uh, peer review, it is a paper that I very much challenge because sometimes it's important to know when you've lost your way and where to find a way back and to look for all action points to address some of the problems that residents keep telling me are about. Um, that needs to be improved. So I welcome very much the planning peer review and quite happy to take any questions. Thank you. So any questions? Councillor Ellie. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll start with start with the most important one to me, if that's OK. Um, so the urgent need to finalise and adopt the draft island planning strategy was identified in the peer review. Uh, whilst we hope the adoption of the IPS will stimulate faster delivery of much needed island homes, it's really for the Regen team who perhaps is not here, um, but can the Regen team confirm what they're doing to accelerate the delivery of affordable homes now? Do you want me to go on with my... Yep, not, not a problem at all. I, 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 what I would ask, Councillor, if I could defer to the item that's at corporate scrutiny next week. Um, and I think the papers for that have already been published. And what you'll see in the attached uh, report to that is a detailed breakdown of the activity that's underway under the housing uh, strategy to deliver affordable homes, not just ourselves, but obviously the wider market. Thank you. Apologies, I hadn't seen those papers. So thank you for that. Councillor Fuller. Yes, I would also uh, reference the. Um, I'm planning strategy that is going to scrutiny committee next week. Um, 
I would like to think that there are some good things about affordable housing. I think what we've seen in the last 10 years is there is a real need for, for you know, particularly younger people, um, people that are elderly and want to reduce the size of their properties to downsize and to be able to do that. And I would like to think that after all the time, both our administration and the Conservative administration is working on it, we've got to a position where we can actually move forward with some positive sort of like uh, um, uh, policies within within the island plan. And I'm very happy to talk about that next week when, um, when uh, I'm hoping to have the team here to be able to put more meat on the bone. But I, I, I appreciate um, your frustration, my frustration. I think the whole island's frustration on trying to get this blessed plan um, put, 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 um, put forward. Thank you. Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think there's always a tendency in, in the myriad number of reports which are generated by the Council for us to potentially paper over some of the cracks and not put down concrete goals that we need to achieve at particular times. I think that's something particularly when it comes to affordable housing we need to address. I think it's equally the case when it comes to some of the issues service users have expressed with regards to planning and the time that it takes um, of the differentiation between the gold standard service that people pay for and, and perhaps not being uh, delivered uh, fully. So can we potentially have some absolute concrete goals, even if we whiz past them. I think it, it's important to focus minds and to get some some ideas actually on the ground. So is that a commitment that could be made perhaps? Thank you. Councillor Fuller. Um, Warren, absolutely. Um, you know, I, th I think one of the frustrations for me is that we it, it, it's very difficult. We hit, you can hit, you can ask. 50 people about their views on the planning uh, planning um, uh, authority and you'll get 50 responses back. I think what we need to do is we need to as crystallise those things. And what I'm looking forward to doing is actually working together with the chairman of the planning committee, um, Councillor Medland, and with um, officers on looking forward to an action plan on those priorities that we want to put, put forward. What I also would welcome as well any feedback from all councillors on anything that they have come across. We know we had the review. We know what we have to do within the peer team. But if there's other things that perhaps is a frustration, come to me, talk to me, and let's see if we can we can address those problems. And I know that you know one of the things that I've said, and I'll be quite honest with it uh, with you, Warren, is that um, I want to I want people to restore restore people's faith and trust in the planning department and planning process. Um, we're not, in, in my view, in a good place. And I would like to take, I would like to move forward and do something positive. You know, we've had the review now. We, I'm quite happy to accept it warts and all, but I want to have the support of people to put in the necessary changes that, that we would like to put in place to make our planning service much more effective and much more friendly to, to, to our service providers and our stakeholders. It's so important for the council and it's so important for our council's credibility. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fuller. Yes, Councillor Ward. Uh, Paul, I was on one of those panels that were interviewed um, by the peer review. Um, and I, I felt actually a bit sorry for our planning department. They get an awful lot of stick and you know, to be fair, I'm probably one of them that gives them a bit of stick about sound down and that sort of stuff. But I think the reality is not, is if they don't have the resources to be able to cope with everything that we ask of them. And I think that's what we've got to look at. How do we give them the resources to do what we want them to do? It's not as if they don't. And sometimes, you know, I, I feel sometimes very embarrassed talking to enforcement officers time and time again. And I know they're trying hard and I've told Ollie, you know, I appreciate what they do. I really do. But they're, you know, they're, they're really up against the wall. I know it's we need to look at resources for them. Absolutely spot on, Councillor Ward. And, and, and you know, I was talking to Ollie about the, this exact thing um, last week. And I think one of the issues that we have um, nationally within planning departments is that a lot of people are pulling away from working for planning departments. Mm. Then working for agencies, they can earn a lot more money working for agencies. And when you look at the demographics on the island, we perhaps can't throw as much money at our officers 
as, as other authorities can. And I think we need to be mindful of that. And we have to be mindful of, of the, the position that we are. So again, we probably are uh, being hit probably harder than, than a lot of councils are, yeah. but it is a national problem. And, yeah, yeah. you know, certainly what I'm, I'm seeing from, from my team in the department at the moment is that the, we, we thought that the bulge that we had in planning applications was going to, to sort of like um, relent a little bit. It hasn't. You know, the case work for, for our team is huge and it's having an effect on our officers. And yes, we need to invest more resources into it. But there's probably things that we can do as well. And, and things that have been picked up with the planning peer review is that perhaps we can work differently with, with our planning team and get different people involved in how they focus people. Because again, I get a lot of people coming to me saying, well, planning officers um, haven't, uh, haven't responded to my email, which I sent to them a couple of weeks ago. Um, can you chase, chase things up? Maybe there's a different way we can do it. And again, any, any ideas that come from you, you guys would be really, really appreciated because I'm quite excited on taking it forward. And I'm very, very enthusiastic about um, the peer review, and I hope we can get some really good positive outcomes in six months' time for me to say, well, we've done A, B, and C as a response to this peer review. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bullock. Councillor Downer. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman. Yes, I'll just, I'll just sort of follow on from what Councillor Ward has said. Now, how understaffed actually is the planning department? And I'll see a lot of new names on applications and things. And is it a bit of a revolving door with agency planning officers? The other thing I would like to say is I've spoken to enforcement officers. They're still absolutely snowed under with stuff that went on during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Now, is there going to be a, how, how really strapped are the enforcement team? I know they're snowed under. Can you any help be given to them to ease the load a bit? and uh, to get through that and so they're on a more even keel thank you thank you councillor downey down rodney i think uh, one of the issues that i have is that there is a lot of firefighting going on at the moment and i think what we can do to support our team is is um is 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 important i think you know certainly as members we do some 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 members particularly can give give members of um, of our, our planning department quite a hard time over and over again. And I think what we need to do is we need to respect them and we also need to respect the time that they're using responding to councillors. Sometimes um, it, it is very, very difficult. Um, you know, what I, would, I'm, I want to do is I want to be able to look at how um, planning officers are responding to councillors and seeing if we can do things in a diff slightly different way. Um, you know, it, 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 it's looking at best practice in other authorities. Um, we we do struggle on the island. We struggle with the recruitment, and that is is making the situation a lot worse. But I think accepting that that's been a problem. That's been a problem. It was a problem this uh, last year. It was a problem two years ago. We need to get this addressed. We need to be able to have a planning service that we can be proud of, and we can defend. 100% um, at the, uh, and, and that is really important to me and this is a step in the right direction and I welcome the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fuller. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was a question following on from Councillor Downers in, in terms of, of the finances and perhaps Councillor John might be able to assist with this, but in terms of the latitude we have within the budget for potentially increasing what we're giving to planning, even potential on a temporary basis to, to overcome those issues. Do we have that latitude? And, and if not, is that something potentially we might be able to explore temporarily? Thank you. If you'd like me to come in first, I think last year um, the chief executive did give um, a lot of extra money for the, for the planning department. Um, what we, we have seen is that although there was a lot of money given to the planning department to, to support them, there are still problems. Um, what I've said to colleagues is, if we didn't have that extra support that we gave, what what position would would our planning department be in? And and that is a real worry. Um, I think what we need to do is we can't keep our eyes uh, off the ball. I know members won't take their eyes off the ball. They will carry on giving me a hard time when I when uh, officers can't deal with them. But I think I think I think being honest with with the situation. 
that we are in within the planning department is so important. We can't keep on saying, yes, everything's fine when that isn't the case. And I think that has been referenced quite a lot within the report that you ask the Isle of Wight Council what they think of the Isle of Wight Council's planning department and they'll say everything's fine when the reality is they need help, they need support and I'm, I'm more than happy to take support wherever I can get it. Thank you. Councillor Charles, do you want to say something? Yes, thank you Councillor Drew and thank you Councillor Fuller for jumping in. Um, the answer is yes, yes, there is latitude. Yes, we've provided money in the past and yes, there's more money that we can provide if we know exactly what the solution is and where we would spend that money efficiently. I think that's part of the problem is knowing how to tackle the problem. You know, we, we all moan about it. We hear the moans from our residents coming about it. And I know that there are moans coming in as well from the developer community and those who are putting in applications who are waiting too long to hear back from them. So I think there is a, a, an issue here in terms of the skill gap. There's probably an issue in terms of the mechanisms that we employ to respond to those people. And very often you might find that a very senior planning person is getting back to you on a relatively minor issue, whereas perhaps there's a more efficient way to deal with those sort of inquiries. So I think once we've looked at the nature of the service, we can decide how to solve those sort of problems and how to employ the resources but we are very prepared to bring forward the money to make those things happen. Thank you, Councillor Jarman. Are there any further questions on the planning review? No, in that case, we'll move on to the, back to Councillor Jordan. It's the uh, traffic regulation order policy. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, what, what you have in your papers here is a committee report coming to cabinet, which is a new policy. It's a new policy that essentially brings, although this may sound odd, it brings to the highways authority the ability to make a decision on requests for TROs uh, from wherever they come. Specifically, if you read the summary at uh, page 41, agenda item seven, uh, it sets out the summary sets out the principle of the regulation order and the proposed essential uh, framework for making decisions on TROs. And the policy is aiming to balance the need for new traffic regulation. So it's a balance of need uh, to ensure safety for all road users against the impact on the local community amenities. If I may, uh, Chair, uh, for a long period of time, one particular set of requests for TROs uh, has come through the planning department where a condition may have been attached to the approval, either by the committee or by planning officers. And it appears in the past that that would generate a request for a TRO and that following due process, the TRO was implemented. What this policy seeks to do is to put the decision making with the highways authority according to regulations and considerations of the local area where the request for the TRO emanates and not necessarily to follow the previous course of action, which was to grant the TRO because it has been conditioned and therefore a request from the planning committee or planning officer or the planning authority. Uh, so that's the background to it, uh, members. And the rest is written out. The policy is written out. There's no point you can read it. There's no point going through it. But essentially, the policy is to give comfort to the council if they so felt in certain circumstances that a TRO would not best suit the local community. Uh, the further point of the policy is to, in those cases where a TRO may be considered, that loss of on-road parking spaces are to be mitigated. In other words, 
if a TRO loses car parking spaces in the vicinity of a development, we would seek to have those spaces in the near vicinity replaced in some way or other. Uh, Chair, that's essentially it. It comes to Cabinet next week, as you probably well know, and happy to take any questions on it. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. I think it's a very clear policy. Are there any questions or comments? Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's probably an obtuse question, but um, apologies. I've uh, only just read the papers this morning. In terms of the appeal mechanism in the event that the community is um, upset about it, what is the process? Uh, and is it something that is fairly easily accessible to the community? Thank you. So, uh, ap appealed by whom? The, uh, uh, by the public, by town and parish councils, or by developers, or by the planning authority even? Which were appealed by whom? Thank you. I was thinking predominantly of, of the public, the man on the street, as it were. Thank you. So uh, the process remains the same. Uh, the public will be consulted. There'll be a slight change in that we will not bring forward the TRO if there was not sufficient support from the local community and the town and parish council for implementation of the TRO. So we wouldn't e it wouldn't even get past muster. Uh, so. Uh, the the process remains the same for the community if uh, we implement the tro uh, and they are unhappy uh, there that that's the decision of the highways authority and the local community at that stage would have little recourse uh, because they'd have been part of the process to get us through to the tro so it's it's all the pre-work on this it's 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 actually moving the process should have mentioned this, so thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity by your question. It's moving the process more backwards towards the start of the process, unlike now. Right now, uh, the consultation process goes to the Highways Authority. It's delivered for us by Island Roads, and they are asked to comment at a late stage on what might be required in the vicinity of a development on the basis that it exists. So it's the it's the horse after the car. What, what we're now trying to do is say, talk to us before the development exists to see if there are other opportunities uh, for safe traffic management. Uh, and uh, with the town and parishes and the public are, will be part of that process. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Thank very much. Chairman, as the cabinet member has indicated, this is going to cabinet next week. Do the policy and scrutiny committee wish to make a, a formal uh, acknowledgement of support for the policy or offer any particular comment? I think we would support it. It's seems yeah. like a good piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a proposal a second. Can I have a show of hands? So that's to formally support the policy. Right. Well, Awesome. Thank you. All right, we'll move on then to point eight on the agenda, which is a program of works verbal updates by Councillor Bacon. Thank you, Chair. Um, the two points I'll just run through both together uh, are about the uh, allocations uh, made in the budget in respect of uh, essentially rights of way and tree planting. Um, Obviously, an allocation was made um, that has to be turned into a viable spend. Uh, the two things are different, of course. Um, we obviously have to look at how best to spend uh, money that might have been allocated and indeed whether um, there are alternatives and how uh, the council's priorities are best served. Uh, in relation to the rights of way element, um, currently the position is that the rights of way manager and his team have been developing the program of improvements and to date have identified projects totaling 200,000 uh, in value, um, including the usual th the sort of things one would expect, upgrading status and surface paths, uh, general surfacing improvements, network improvements, boardwalks, footbridges, steps, gates, etc. Um, but also the creation and implementation of a new right-of-way database um, to obviously aid in providing a complete picture 
of the rights of way uh, assets and condition of those assets. Um, I can give you some of the locations if you wish, but uh, that might be better to circulate an email separately if you're interested. Uh, as far as hedge and tree planting is concerned, um, again, I think um, I mentioned the need to look at uh, what is the best way to spend money. Um, and one must bear in mind there's a, a green economy developing whereby tree planting may well be essentially financed from other sources, uh, allowing us to use money in different ways. Um, and that might happen through the planning process indeed, as we've just been discussing. Uh, but what we have done so far, there's an ongoing program of tree planting um, and the program so far in this year has seen 520 trees planted, 420 of those are whips, 100 standard trees, uh, and another 134 are planned. Um, those have either been delivered by the council or sometimes the council working with other partners. Um, Green Gym, I'm sure you're aware of, Planet Aware, and some of the town and parish councils, as well as, uh, in some cases, individual residents, uh, community groups and schools. Um, and part of that work has also, uh, I suppose, been undertaken through the, uh, the Queen's Green Canopy programme. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning in relation to uh, tree planting and how one best proceeds and plans what could be done. Uh, we're developing an application to the Forestry Commission uh, seeking a sum uh, funds of £150,000, uh, which would fund staff or perhaps uh, enable a use of an external agency to identify land, whether it's council land or private land that could facilitate future tree planting opportunities. Um, that application is not, I don't think it's gone in just yet. Early July is the date and we are in early July, but I don't think it's quite gone in. Uh, and obviously, uh, if we are successful in that, that will be a key part of planning, uh, purchase, planting, maintenance of trees going forward. Um, I hope that's gives a, a full update for where we are at this moment in time. Thank you, Councillor Bacon. I'd, I'd be very interested to see more detail about the um, right of way uh, uh, document you mentioned. Perhaps that could be shared with other members of the committee as well. Well, I'm happy that. to circulate that list. Thank you. Are there any point, any questions at all? Like Councillor Downer. Yeah, um, going back to the rights of way, Councillor Bacon, um, I do know that they are understaffed. Is there any, um, because uh, I'll get a lot of complaints about uh, uh, footpaths and broadways not being cut out and been overgrown. And I do recall that when Tim Slate was in charge of it years ago, they won an award. And also that I've, I've submitted a motion to call council uh, in the last administration about actual funding for rights of way. Um, may I ask about the hedges as well at the same time? To save time. Go ahead. Right. Um, the hedge planting, particularly important, is the the to stop soil erosion because when they took a lot of hedges out in in fields and that, you get all the runoff, and that that erodes the soil. So hedges are, are vital, and also for uh, birds and, and and wildlife. Could you also say? Uh, give us an idea of what species will be planted in the hedgerows. Are they quick growing ones? Because if they're quite quick growing, they're going to take in more CO2, aren't they? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Professor Bacon? I'm a non horticulturalist, but I'll do what I can. I um, apologise, Sir <laughs> I'm not going to attempt to list species, but. There, there are two sides to that point about species, though, because sometimes the quick growing ones are not necessarily the sustainable ones that give a long life. And while they might have an immediate effect uh, on carbon reduction, the long term effect uh, is not so good. And certainly, I have a little more knowledge of trees and hedgerows, but uh, the sort of traditional broadleaf tree, uh, while it takes longer to establish and grow, is going to be the better uh, bet in the long run, shall we mm. say. Um, I'm sure that uh, information about particular species can be 
gain, but as I say, I'm not going to bench down what for me this is a very dark alley in that regard. Um, certainly the hedges are part, I, I did say the, uh, the consideration is in relation to tree and hedge planting. The work done to date is obviously, as you've heard, primarily in relation to trees and those are the figures I've given, but hedges are part of the process, but I couldn't report uh, in all honesty any specific hedge planting that has undertaken to date. So I'm again happy to look into that. Um, I think the other point you asked was about staffing in relation to rights of way. Um, at the moment, the existing team have been working and identifying things they think they could do. It may be that as we take this forward, um, allocation uh, is considered in relation to staffing, but of course that's an ongoing cost and this is a, as it stands, a one-off allocation. Uh, and, and not a necessarily a repeating figure. But uh, I think all of us who have uh, rural elements to our wards know that there is an issue with the maintenance of rights of way. Um, and while improvements are a good thing, um, one needs to be able to try and ensure those improvements uh, are, are maintained and sustained. Uh, so that's an ongoing question. Well, thank you. Perhaps I could plant Curtellius Hawthorne. Pass on your sage advice. <laughs> well, thank you. That was very useful. Are there any other guests? To the uh, Councillor Ellis. Thank you. So on hedges, I agree with Councillor Downey. We want some hawthorn and blackthorn mixed in there. Um, if they're very fast growing, then you have obviously got the problem that you're going to have to cut them more. Um, yeah, Councillor Bacon, within that five hundred thousand for restoring hedgerows of planting trees as you suggested it may not all need to be used because individuals are planting trees or partners are is there any room perhaps to support individuals that are outside of the council that might want to restore or plant a hedge uh, as i understand yes i think i indicated that as i said it's a tree and hedge planting program and work has already uh, occurred with green gym planet aware I don't have a list of all the town and parish councils, but some of those, as well as uh, schools as well. Councillor Ward. Come on. Jonathan, mine's a similar question. Is there, are there, are there trees still available? We've got a couple of community groups that have shown an interest. Oh, it's probably all gone by now, but are they still available? If Uh, well, it's not as if we've got a warehouse full of trees oh, um, to, <laughs> to hand out, but I'm sure if you were to contact the tree officers um, and uh, indicated that there's a, an appropriate location, particularly if it's work with a community, um, they can advise on what can be obtained, what can be obtained most economically and when's best to plant it as well, which is obviously part of the consideration of uh, uh, how this program develops because you plant the trees sometime in the years, but even with my limited knowledge, Rodney, I know that it won't grow. <laughs> oh, Any other questions on this point? Well, okay. And um, we move on to point 10 is the committee's work plan. I'll hand back to this, this would take us through this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, the, the paper uh, agenda item 10 sets out the future work plan and members will see from the, the, the details there. The 6th of October is quite going to be quite a, a busy meeting. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get all those reports delivered on time. Um, going forward into 2023, there are gaps for uh, some of the committee, so we are always welcome uh, suggested agenda items either from members of the committee uh, cabinet members or fellow directors. So it's, it's always a, a moving feast. We're always welcome to uh, make suggestions and make sure that the work plan remains current. Chairman. Thank you. That takes us on to point 11, which is members' question time. Um, does anyone want to ask a question? No? You're all happy. It's the end of the meeting, and that's a close of meeting. Thank you all very much for your participation.